All right, Alexander, let's talk about Ukraine. There's lots to get to, but the uh, the big story, I guess, is, uh, not I guess, is definitely the drone attack in uh, Sevastopol, the Russian Federation pulling out of the grain deal, and the revelation from the Ministry of Defense and then the Russian Foreign Ministry that, that well, they claim, they claim that the UK uh, was behind the sabotage of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. So uh, we haven't talked about this on the Duran um, yet, but uh, what are your thoughts on all of these topics? And I was thinking this morning in the video that I did this morning, that everyone is talking about when you get to the grain deal and you talk about your thoughts on the grain deal and Russia pulling out. I was thinking this morning on my video that, you know, everyone is talking about the grain deal in Odessa, but uh, you know, that grain deal that uh, the Russians entered into in July had two components to it. There was the Odessa component, which was kind of minor if you ask me, the big component to that grain deal was lifting sanctions on Russian grain and fertilizer and allowing that grain and fertilizer to enter the market, which over the past four months just has not happened because uh, the sanctions may have been lifted by the collective West, but they uh, created all kinds of different obstacles to get the Russian grain, not Ukrainian grain, Russian grain to the markets that need it, the poorest countries in the world. And so no one is talking about that component, which I think was the actual main component of that entire uh, grain deal that was signed in um, in July. Anyway, though, I was just thinking about that this yeah. morning as I was doing my video that, you know, no one's really talking about the important part of, uh, of the grain deal. Anyway, uh, your thoughts on everything that happened. Well, first of all, can I just, just come back to what you said? Because, of course, we discussed this at great length in the programs that we did at the time of the grain deal was reached. And you're absolutely correct. Now, Ukraine does supply grain, and it is an important grain exporter. But it is completely dwarfed by Russia. Russia is a far bigger grain exporter than Ukraine. It's also a major supplier of fertilizer. And of course, what had happened up to July was that even though the European Union, and we're basically talking here about the European Union because the United States has a more distant role in this grain trade and export trade for Russian grains, the European Union never formally imposed sanctions on Russian food and uh, fertilizer exports. In practice, the sanctions that they launched meant that those exports of food and fertilizer came to a complete stop. So a deal was done in July, and I think July is an important month because, as I'm going to discuss, timing in all of this matters a great deal. And we're going to look at the Sevastopol attacks in a moment because they obviously have bearing on this. But we, we're coming back now to July. So what happened was Putin went around. He gave interview after interview. He said, look, you know, Ukraine is important. We are far more important. The real problem is that nobody's buying our, we're not able to export our grain because it's all blocked in Western ports. Uh, our fertilizers are also blocked in Western ports. Uh, people are reluctant to um, carry our grain on their ships because they worry every day that Western sanctions might be imposed. And uh, that will mean that they'll lose insurance and that they could face fines. So the result is we can't export in the way that we want to export. And it's our exports that are essential in order to make food supplies, to stabilize food supplies around the world. And what happened was you then got a procession of leaders from various um, countries of the global south coming along, and they, was, they clearly accepted Putin's views on this. And after a lot of negotiations, which involved Guterres, the UN Secretary General, and the UN, a deal was done. Now, the Russians have always insisted that they have never blockaded Odessa to merchant ships. They've never sought 
to prevent ships with grain leaving Odessa. That's what they have consistently said. And they're still saying it, by the way. And I think it's a, something we need to talk about in a moment. But they did say, look, to the extent that you're not able or you, you have this psychological problem that prevents you exporting grain through Odessa, we're prepared to set up these humanitarian corridors. We're prepared to deal with, you know, we're going to do it with, with Turkey. The Turks can provide escorts. There need to be inspections to make sure that ships don't come in and out of Odessa transporting weapons and things of that kind. But we're, we're, we're prepared to enter into a deal over this, provided the EU in return makes it clear that our exports of grain and fertilizer are unblocked because that's the ones that really matter. So, an deal was indeed reached. The European Union issued, issued a statement in which they said categorically, "We have no, we have no sanctions on Russian food and fertilizer exports, and we are uh, have no intention of ever imposing such um, such sanctions." And in fact. They even appear to row back some of their sanctions that they previously uh, imposed, which appeared to affect Russian exports of food and fertilizer. And as, on that basis, Ukraine was able to export, ship, you know, through its ships, through ships, grain from Odessa. Except, of course, that as so often happens, the EU said one thing, and it did something completely different. And the mechanism through which it was done is, of course, unknown. But the fact is that even though the EU said no problems about exports of Russian food and fertilizer through EU ports, you know, through ships, which don't need to worry about, you know, having their insurance taken away in mid, you know, mid in the middle of the sea. Or, or being uh, fined, the ship owners don't need to worry about being fined, anything of that kind. Somehow, nothing happened. All those Russian exports of food and fertilizer remained exactly as a, at a standstill as they had in July. And then, of course, on top of everything else, the Russians started to grumble. And I think here, the figures basically bear them out. That you know, this whole thing about Russia Ukrainian food exports, it was always talked up as being done for the benefit of the global south, the countries, the poorer countries in the world. But in practice, most of the grain and most of the foodstuffs that Ukraine was exporting were going to the EU. Now, there's lots of different figures, percentages going around. I mean, the lowest I've seen is that 50% went to the EU. Others put it much higher than that, up to 90% going to the EU. I'm not able to say which of those figures is correct, but just consider 50% going to the EU. The EU is not 50% of the world's population, obviously. So whatever it is, it is a fact that it is EU consumers who are getting a disproportionate amount of this Ukrainian food that's being exported. So the Russians were already becoming very unhappy about this deal. And then we got this attack on, on Sevastopol, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But there is something else. And uh, this is why I said timing is so important in all of this. Because, of course, when the Russians agreed to all of this in July, we had a different military situation then. At that time... Uh, as we now know, the Russians were starting to run short of troops. Many of the troops with uh, six months contracts were uh, returning to civilian life. Um, it was clear that the Russians were not going to take launch a big offensive in August or September. They weren't interested in going after cities to the west like Nikolaev, Odessa itself. So from their point of view, it made complete sense in July because they were not going to attack Odessa anytime soon to come to an agreement that established humanitarian corridors from Odessa. We're now in October 
at the very end of October, the last day of October, in fact, the situation is changing. Russia is calling up 300,000 men. 80,000 of those have already joined the military that's actually fighting this war. 40,000 are on the front lines. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands more are coming. We've been informed that the Russian military grouping west of the Dnieper in Kherson region has doubled in size. And we're now starting to see offensive action being taken in various places along the front line. So it seems to me that a deal which made sense from the Russians' point of view in July, both because it looked like it would unblock their exports and because at that time they had no immediate plans with respect to Odessa, now makes a great deal less sense. They haven't been able to get their food and fertilizer exports unblocked. And at the same time, they're now perhaps getting closer to that point where they might be able to start launching serious offensives towards the West, towards Odessa. So it might make less sense to them from a military point of view anyway, putting aside the missile attacks, which we're going to come to in a moment, to agree humanitarian corridors from Odessa, if those humanitarian corridors might obstruct, get in the way of whatever military operation towards Odessa might be coming. So look at, think of the timing, think of the changes in the situation, think about also the fact that the deal from a Russian point of view has never really worked. If, the, if Ukraine and the EU had really wanted this deal to work, they would have made sure that those exports of Russian food and Russian fertilizer had been able to take place without interruption. But of course, the EU did what it always does or has repeatedly done. It pretended to strike a deal with the Russians, which it had no intention of honoring. We've seen that all going all the way back to the Minsk agreements and beyond. Remember, the major EU states were parties to the Minsk agreements, but, you know, they signed off on them, uh, uh, Merkel and Hollande, but they have no intention, as we now know, or at least as now appears, of ever obliging the Ukrainians to implement those agreements. And it looks like it was the same with the food deal. So the Russians have said, well, from every point of view, this thing isn't working. It's not working for us. It's not working for the global south. And at the same time, the military situation is different now from what it was in July. We're back on the offensive or will be very soon. And we might as well, in light of this, say goodbye to this deal, which just isn't working for us anymore. Yeah, before we get to the, uh, I want to talk a bit about the Nord Stream uh, allegations as well, um, and, and perhaps how Russia has retaliated, if, if it was a retaliation because Russia is now hitting the, uh, the, energy, the energy infrastructure again, the electric, the electric infrastructure again in Ukraine, they're hitting it hard. Um, they also took out what they claim was the, uh, where the, this is what the Russians claim, where the British were operating in the Nikolaev region. They also struck, struck at that as well, but we'll get into that in a bit. What, one thing that's, that's troubling me that I have a question about is the Aletsky regime was making money on this grain deal. Turkey was making money processing this grain. Uh, I'm sure the EU, there were various EU actors making a lot of money on, uh, on this grain deal. Uh, nothing goes down in Ukraine without a whole bunch of people, you know, making all kinds of, uh, of cash from it. Plus, you give the Russians by, by having the Russians pull out of the grain deal, you give the Russians, like you said, and, and I noted this as well, you give them the opportunity or the possibility to now um, push towards Odessa they don't have to worry about the, the humanitarian, the, the corridors. Why then did Ukraine, perhaps with the help of the planning of the British, as the Russians claim, is what the Russians claim, why would they uh, 
go forward with this drone strike. Well, I, I can't you, figure out the upside yeah, for yeah, Ukraine to yeah, this, unless yeah. it's just part of the overall media yeah. PR hysteria side of things. Yeah, well, I think to answer your question quickly, I think it is part of the media PR side of things. But briefly, I don't think any of these parties that you mentioned, Turkey, the UN, the EU or Ukraine, thought the Russians were going to pull out of the grain deal. I think that they all assumed that the Russians would be too embarrassed to pull out of the grain deal. They would be, uh, you know, they would they would not want to have fingers pointed at them. So they'd stick with the grain deal. So they thought that, you know, just as they did with the Minsk agreement, that, you know, they could pull a fast one on the Russians and it wouldn't matter uh, because the Russians would just sit back and accept it. And, you know, it's not entirely surprising because if you look at the past history, the Russians have sat back and accepted an awful lot. I, I mean, they, they, they talked even in this war, earlier in the war, there's attacks on their own territory. They would not hesitate to go after the command centers and they haven't gone after the command centers. Just one example. But I mean, eight years, for example, they went on with the Minsk agreement. And we've now learned more, an awful lot more about what was going on there. And we now know, for example, that Macron was telling Putin last year, forget about the Minsk agreements. You know, the, nobody takes those seriously anymore. That wasn't ever really, they weren't ever really intended seriously. You sit down with Zelensky and agree with him some way of uh, getting Donbass returned to Ukraine. And in return, we'll lift the sanctions. I mean, you know, they were, they were being absolutely as brazen about it as that because they assumed that Donbass didn't really matter to the Russians. And I think they assumed also with this grain deal that the Russians wouldn't pull out of it because from their point of view, this was something that would cause them some international embarrassment and that they wouldn't want to accept that kind of embarrassment. And now, of course, what's happened is that to their horror, the Russians have pulled out of the grain deal. Now, by the way, that doesn't in and of itself stop ships leaving Odessa with grain. As I said, coming back to what I was saying before, the Russians have always said, always said, that they're not imposing that kind of blockade on Odessa. They've never said that they're stopping ships with grain leaving Odessa. They've said that they have a right to inspect them, which they might exercise or, or not, as the case may be. But what they're saying now is that they're not imposing a blockade what they're saying is that if there's any more attacks on their facilities, then the ship, the sea lanes through which these ships move um, are no longer covered by this deal. They're no longer humanitarian corridors. Russian warships and Russian aircraft can enter them and they're prepared to attack Ukrainian targets that are operating in these sea lanes. And if any grain ships get caught in the crossfire, well, Adequate warning has now been given. They're not prepared to protect those ships. They can't safeguard them anymore because Russia's participation in this has now ended. So I think I just wanted to make that last point clear because I think there's been some misrepresentation of this. Uh, anyway, that's that's where we are. I think the reason they did it, what the Western powers, Ukraine, did it was they thought they could, you know, get the grain moving from Ukraine, get it sent to Europe, bring down food prices or reduce the rise in food prices in Europe because that's where most of the food was going to. And um, the Russians would be blow hot and cold, but they wouldn't really raise, do anything about the fact that the other part of the deal was not being implemented. No, I mean, the... The whole problem with the with the grain um, from Odessa back over the summer was uh, was created by Ukraine because it was uh, the Olenski regime that decided to throw all those mines. And yeah. That was where much exactly. of this originated. He decided to yeah. mine the whole uh, Black exactly. Sea, and, exactly. and that caused a problem. And because he couldn't come out and say, "Well, you know, I I, I threw mines everywhere, and they're floating all over the place." Some of the mines ended up near Turkey. I remember exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and he couldn't say that, though. At least the collective West couldn't have that narrative out there that, 
this was part of uh, Alensky's idiotic move to, to mine everything. They came up with the Russian blockade story. Yes. I mean, that was story. completely fiction. Yes. And yes. that was just about distracting away from, from Alensky's uh, mining yes. of, uh, yes. of the Black Sea. But before, <laughs> before we, we leave this topic, uh, I have another just quick uh, observation which uh, you may want to comment on. There's a cynical part of me, which says, I, I agree with everything you said about uh, the reasons for them going after the uh, the ships in Sevastopol. But there's also a cynical side of me that says, perhaps the neocons kind of said, and, and these neocon forces, they kind of said, you know what? Yeah, let's uh, let's see if we can hit some ships in Sevastopol. And even if the Russians pull out of the, the grain deal, even if they actually decide to, to follow through and pull out from this deal. Yeah, it'll be an embarrassment to them, but you know, we could, we could play that up in the media. So we'll get a win there. We'll amplify that in the media. We'll make them look bad. And we get to also uh, bury the European Union a little bit more. Yeah. I think right. this is totally kind of hit at the EU yeah. a little bit more. I, 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 I think this is, yeah. I think this is entirely true. Now let's go back to the, you know, the Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two and Britain's role in it and all that. Now, how the Russians know that, we don't know. How they know that the British were involved. The British, of course, vigorously denied that they had any role in it. The British vigorously denied that they had any role in the Sevastopol attack. The the only problem, the problem the British have in denying that they had a role with the Sevastopol attack is that I can remember reading weeks ago, weeks ago, in the British media about how uh, um, Britain was supplying drones <laughs> to, you know, ship drones, you know, naval drones to Ukraine. And, I mean, I don't know for a fact that these are the drones which we've just seen, but, you know, everything suggests that they are. And, I mean, you know, some of them use... Uh, uh, you know, I, well, I don't know what, what kind of components they use, but I mean, logically, everything points to this being an operation carried out with British technology and most probably with British involvement. And of course, there's two things to say about this. Firstly, that the British have been brought up with these stories of you know, daring do, exciting things that were done during the Second World War, launching attacks, penetrating into harbours. I mean, people may have may remember some of those films that have appeared about this, but, you know, um, attack, you know, the attack on the Italian fleet in Taranto, <laughs> the uh, uh, attack on the Tirpitz, the uh, German battleship in the uh, uh, Norwegian fjord, all of those sorts of things. And it's, incredibly embedded it seems in the British psyche and this looks to me this whole operation at some level looks to me like another attempt to do that very same thing with the Russian fleet in Sevastopol find some you know means of penetrating Sevastopol harbor with drones and uh, sub you know these these ship drones as well you know launch an attack disable the Russian fleet and of course I mean, that's not real life, actually. That might work in the movies, but it doesn't work in today's world. And, of course, the Russians detected these things and they were able to parry this attack apparently very effectively and it didn't achieve anything very much, anything of any significance. But I, I can imagine the British coming up with this sort of thing because it is so consistent with their history, their background, and it's the kind of thing also, I have to say, that looks plausible, given, as I said, that these drones are probably British. These ship drones are probably British. And it was discussed in the media here that they, drones like that were being supplied. But there is something else about Britain. And that is that at some fundamental level, and this is really very disturbing and very worrying for me as a British person, we have become joined at the le level of political leadership. We become joined at the hip with the neocons in Washington. And I can't help but worry. What's happening is that, you know, the Americans, the neocons in the US, want to do various things. They understand that if they try to get the US 
itself, the, U the you know, the various people in the US military to do it, well, they might get some pushback. So they look to the British to do it for them instead. And now, I still believe that if you're talking about the attacks on Nord Stream 1 and 2, I think that the US must have had some actual role in those attacks. I mean, I, I know Britain. I mean, no doubt we've got lots of sophisticated technology. We got experience of working deep underwater with, you know, Nord Street, the, the, the North Sea oil uh, developments, all of that sort of thing. But I still think that these attacks could not have happened without the Americans being actively involved, not just giving a green light, but actively involved. But the, the British might have played a key role, a spearhead role, if you like. That I can well believe. And of course, the neocons, as you absolutely rightly say, well, you know, they they push all the time. So they say, you know, we've got this grain deal, there's these humanitarian corridors, Russian ships don't go there. This is our great opportunity to do some tremendous damage to the Russian Navy in Sevastopol. We're going to use these humanitarian corridors for that. And who will help us to do that? Well, the British will. They'll provide the technology. They'll provide the assistance. And we end up, as a result, going along with these harebrained uh, uh, schemes, partly, as I said, derived from films, some culture of whatever it was left over from the Second World War. And I don't think this is good for us. I think we're playing an incredibly reckless and irresponsible game if we are involved. And I, you know, again, I have to repeat, in Britain, it's being vigorously denied. But I'm afraid, to me, living here in Britain, seeing how the British media write about this war, seeing you know the sort of tone that British politicians use, I I have to say, I, I find these Russian allegations entirely plausible. And if they are true, then I think this is very, very reckless and very dangerous for Britain. The paradox is that the wartime generation, the people who actually did do those things during the Second World War, penetrate Toronto Harbour, attack the Tirpitz, all of those sort of people. Those people understood war. They knew how dangerous it was. They would never have done anything as reckless as this. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, of British leaders as once upon a time. On the contrary, in those days, they would have had nothing to do with the neocons and they would have been a force for restraint. And it is alarming to me that the culture seems to have changed so considerably in Britain and that we are being led into these, you know, crazy schemes, which obviously are making serious enemies of the Russians, much more powerful country than we are, and which I suspect others are looking at and shaking their heads and saying it's the crazy British again. Well, um, the New York Times, they read an article um, where they pretty much said that Ukraine is uh, was behind the drone attacks. Now, I, I was thinking, why would the New York Times run an article saying that Ukraine was behind the drone attacks? And then I thought to myself, the reason they're throwing Ukraine under the bus, so to speak, is because they want to distract away from the UK's involvement. Simple. Uh, this leads me to my next uh, comment and, and question. I think you know you said you, you said that these claims have been uh, vehemently denied by the UK. I read some of this. First of all, the UK yeah. have they issued a statement uh, on this, like an official oh, 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 on Sevastopol attacks? Yes, the British on Foreign Street? Minister, the Defence Minister. Okay. I know, no, but on they the put out a tweet. on the Sevastopol the tweet. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. what, what were your thoughts on that? Because I, I, I've well, been reading the tweet, like I read it like 10 times and I thought to myself, I said, there's a little bit of a denial, but it seems yeah. more like trying to distract because they say the tweet Absolutely. stuff like, you know, this is a, this is a distraction for, from, uh, from the Russians because the war is going badly and, and uh, this is evidence. They said this is proof that, uh, that there's infighting in the Kremlin. 
I was kind of like, that's a strange tweet from the Ministry of Defense. I would have Absolutely. been more comfortable if the Ministry of Defense in the UK said something like, we had nothing to do with any of this. Well, exactly. Zero. A simple a, sim a simple statement. You know, uh, 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 we have an expression in British English that someone protests too much. In other words, they're protesting, they're throwing all sorts of things. And in fact, when you really think about the protest, it's almost an admission. And this is, looks like that, actually. I mean, I, I have to say, on the, on the Nord Stream 1 and 2 things, I think the British probably were involved at some level. I think it's highly likely that they were. I don't know that they were, and I want to make that clear. And I still believe, as I said, that the US must have been involved at some level. On the Sevastopol attack, I'm sorry to say this, and I say this you know, with no joy, I think we were involved in exactly the way the Russians say, because it's consistent with everything that um, I've seen and heard from Britain up to now. And I agree with you. If this was, we were not involved, a simple, straightforward denial, saying, you know, we had absolutely nothing to do with this. The Russian allegations are entirely wrong. Uh, um, and, you know, that, that would have been a lot more convincing than trying to find some kind of, you know, narrative about, you know, Russian infighting and the, this illegal, uh, this illegal war, which has been so mismanaged and all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, I mean, th th this is the sort of thing that, as I said, just doesn't ring true as a denial. People who deny things, which they ha really haven't done, are just very, usually, my experience, very matter of fact about it. In this case, as I said, they did protest too much. Right. Okay, so let's wrap it up with uh, an update as to what's going on on the ground. The Russians are hitting the uh, the electric uh, grid, the electric infrastructure again today. They're hitting it hard. Uh, Ukraine, they simply cannot stop the Russian drones and the missiles. It's It's clear as day, no matter how much air defense systems they cobble together from various uh, collective West countries. It's it's just not doing the job. And uh, the Russians are now on the offensive, it seems, in various uh, areas. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I think the most the most notable is Ugladar. But That's right. they're, they're moving That's on it. different fronts. Absolutely. And Kherson, I mean, by the way, seems to be at a stop. Absolutely, yes. I, I mean, I, I agree with your summary. Now, on the missile attacks, I mean, from my understanding, um, this is a this has been a catastrophic day. I mean, this has been the most devastating. Today's missile strikes have been the most devastating of all. They're now targeting the missile, the the electricity substations, and I gather there's there's reports circulating that there's been a discussion in the. Um, at the, at the level of the, you know, the top levels of the Ukrainian government, that this is now fast approaching the point of no return for Ukraine's energy, uh, um, electricity system. So it looks as if we are we are heading towards an energy collapse in Ukraine. And I've been reading articles, more and more articles, about the whole direction of the Ukrainian economy. There was a powerful piece. Remember when I, you know, we talked about some months ago about how Ukraine looked to be moving ever more steadily towards a hyperinflation type situation. Well, this article also reinforces that, that things are getting very bad on that front. And the article made the further point that no country has won a war when it's in a state of hyperinflation. I think that may be an overstatement, by the way, but I certainly don't believe that Ukraine can win a war when it's in a state of hyperinflation. So Ukraine has been hammered with these missile attacks. Now, on the basis of Ukraine not being able to do anything about it, they said that the Russians launched 50 missiles. Ukraine said that it shot down 44, leaving just six missiles to get through. And then they also said that 18 targets had been destroyed. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but even my basic arithmetic says that these are two inconsistent things. So clearly things are going horribly there. And on the battlefronts, you are absolutely right. I mean, from a situation where, you know, a few weeks ago, it was Ukraine that was advancing. Now it's under pressure 
and it's under growing pressure in many places. And if you remember Ugladar, Ugladar, where the Russians are now making serious grounds, and it's an important place. It's a town in southern Donetsk region, had a population of around 15,000 before the war began. Um, it's right you know, at the center of the transport, the, the, the road links and the railway links from uh, you know, central Ukraine to the Ukrainian forces in uh, opposite Donetsk City. We're talking about Ugladar. If you remember back in September at the time of the Kharkov counteroffensive, when Ukraine, you know, recaptured Izium, there were all kinds of reports circulating that in Ugladar, they were going to launch, the Ukrainians were going to launch the next stage of their offensive. And it was going to result in the recapture of Mariupol. That was that was September, mid-September. And now, on the contrary, we've heard that this village, Pavlovka, just on the outskirts of Ugladar, has now been recaptured or largely recaptured by the Russians. There was a report this morning that the road between Ugladar and the Ukrainian forces in Donetsk uh, 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 that's under Russian, the, the Russians are shelling that road. It's within range of their artillery so that they're already able to disrupt the traffic along that road. So we can see how much the situation on the battlefields has shifted. So Ukraine being hammered by missile strikes and Ukraine also facing retreats now on the battlefields and with hundreds of thousands more men joining the Russian army every, well, I mean, you know, this, this build-up is going on remorselessly every day. To wrap up the video, I'm going to ask you one final question. <laughs> We're supposed to wrap up the video on, on your last comment, but I'm going to ask you another question. Timing is everything. You said uh, November 8th midterms. Do you think that the Russians have timed this so that post-November 8th, should the Republicans um, get a decisive win in both the, the House and the Senate, that uh, the Republicans are, are going to be left with a very difficult decision to make in that Ukraine is collapsing, the economy is collapsing, on the military front is collapsing, the energy infrastructure is, is destroyed and the Republicans are gonna be left with a decision do we continue to follow Biden and the neocons and the neoliberals down this war path, or do we pull out? And perhaps I, the timing of all of this is so that post November eighth, I don't know, say November fifteenth or something like that. Yeah, maybe November, maybe the end of November as well. The the entire administration, the Biden administration, the um, House, the House Congress is going to be left with a decision like, look we got to get out of this because this is a major collapse that's coming. Absolutely. I'm sure the Russians are thinking these things. I mean, they're, they're perfectly well aware of the American political calendar. They're perfectly well aware of uh, uh, the other side's strengths and weaknesses, the position of the Biden administration, the position of Joe Biden himself. They, they can read the opinion polls. They can think about all of these things. And what they're saying to themselves is this. Biden administration launched this war. Uh, uh, you know, launched this. They didn't launch. Well, let's take that back. The Biden administration provoked this war. The Biden administration supported Ukraine. The Biden administration stopped Ukraine negotiating a peace deal with us, which it almost successfully did way back in March. The un Biden administration poured weapons into Ukraine. It's given Ukraine a virtual bank blank check in terms of everything, you know, that's happened since then. And what's happening? What's going to happen soon? This is what the Republicans may be thinking to themselves, is we have this vast, hideous mess. We see Ukraine collapsing economically, plunging into hyperinflation. We see its military gradually being ground to ground down. And you remember, you know, the new Russian commander, Surovikin, actually used that. He said, we're going to grind the Ukrainian military down. And that's what the Russians are doing. So why should we, Republicans, own this mess? 
This is a mess that the administration has brought about. So we don't wish we don't want to own this. We don't want to send tens upon tens upon tens of billions more to Ukraine, which after all is going down a you know plug hole or so it must seem to the American people. And above all, given the scepticism of our own electorate, Biden brought this about, Biden created it, Biden owns it. We can say enough's enough. This has gone hideously wrong. We're going to worry about the American people. We're going to worry about the fact that prices in the United States are rising, that the economy's in a bad way, that everything's going to pieces under Biden. And as for this collapse in Ukraine, well, that's just more proof of what a disastrous president he has been. So I'm sure that, you know, there are people in the Republican Party who are already thinking in the, along those lines. And it's not difficult for the Russians to figure that out. And of course, I'm sure that they are judging their moves to some extent in... Um, in, synch in synchronizing them with the, with with the political timetable of course they would i mean you know inevitably every country in this kind of situation does especially given um how well known the midterms in the united states are the whole world knows about the midterms so of course they know about them in moscow i mean it's inconceivable that they don't and, um, you know, this is to some extent working like that for the Russians by chance. But as you've correctly said, to some extent, they've timed it. I'm sure they have. Yeah. It'd be incredible if they hadn't. Yeah, I agree. So much of the of the world, pretty much outside of NATO, despises Joe Biden. No one really likes him. Talking about MBS, uh, Xi Jinping. I'm sure Putin's the same. They, they all they all despise Biden. The Russians know about all the stuff he was up to in Ukraine before the conflict, post Maidan, Burisma, all those things. I'm convinced that that uh, that they want to really stick it to him as well. I'm not saying that's the I, driving I, factor in anything, but I'm I'm sure they're they're all sitting there saying we're going to just bury Biden. Absolutely. I'm I mean. Sure it, that, yeah. On your point, you are absolutely 100% right. The entire world outside the collective West doesn't like this president. And in, in Putin's case, Putin and Biden clearly have had a long history, uh, um, and it's not a history if it's been a good one. I mean, by all accounts, they, they haven't liked each other. Xi Jinping, as I repeatedly said in various programs, has said to Biden, you know, pretty straightforwardly, you're lying to me over Taiwan. I get the sense that Modi doesn't think much of Biden. Uh, uh, MBS, MBS, MBS yeah. can't stand Biden, and he's made that absolutely obvious. I can't think of anybody outside the collective West who likes him. And uh, that's, I think, something Americans perhaps are not aware of, just as Americans aren't aware of the fact which you know, I perhaps shouldn't say, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is that outside the collective West, a lot of the world actually warmed to Donald Trump. They found him funny. They found him genuine. They found him real. They liked him. They never liked Bison. Yeah. All right. We will leave it there. We covered a lot of ground. We had a lot to talk to, a lot to talk about. <laughs> we will, uh, we will uh, end the video there. Look for us on the Duran.locals.com. We are now on Rockfin and um, the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.